Fellow classmates, friends, family, and faculty. My name is Katherine Zhang, and I'm a proud resident. <laughs> and I'm a proud resident of Cabot House, studying, psych <laughs> studying psychology and educational studies, and, as you may have guessed, a graduating senior. It is my greatest honor to serve as the first marshal for the class of 2019, and a huge welcome to the 2019 Class Day exercises. Today is a day of celebration, celebrating our journey to Harvard and at Harvard, and everyone who has been a part of it. Four or more years ago, we arrived at Harvard, overwhelmed and excited, unsure of the paths we would lead. We came in wondering where we would find community, what we would eventually study, and how we would grow and change. While we could not predict how the world around us would change, we came in eager to learn from each other, from our different stories, backgrounds, and passions. We met people along the way who would brighten our days, work with us through grueling times, join us in crazy antics, and deeply touch our lives. It is those who surround us that make this day and this journey possible. Thus, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to so many of you. To the 2019 class committee, thank you for the dedication and the heart that you've put in to keeping our class community strong and thriving. To the Harvard Alumni Association and Harvard College Fund, and especially our advisors, John Prince and Molly Stanzik. <laughs> Thank you for your endless support. Without you, today and the entire year's worth of senior programming would not have happened. To my village, which includes my family in the audience, thank you for the unconditional love you've shown. I am forever indebted and forever grateful. And to the friends, mentors, and families here with us today, none of us would be here without you. This celebration is just as much yours as it is ours. As we move into our next chapter, I imagine many of us are feeling the same way as when we first stepped onto campus. Overwhelmed and excited, wondering where we are going to find community, unsure of what the world will look like in the future, and searching for what our place will be in it. But this time, remember that we carry with us these past four years of growth and many, many memories. My hope for you as we move forward is that you continue your journey of self-improvement, deeply cherish your relationships, fail often and fail cheerfully, dream big, give yourself grace, and always look for ways to be of service to others. I am so excited to see the communities we will become a part of and the ways in which we will give back to them, 
For as a dear mentor once told me, to whom much is given, much is expected. And we've been given a lot. Forever will we be graduates of the Harvard class of 2019. Finally, I want to end by saying thank you. In this class, I found not just an inspiring and kick-ass community, but a home. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing an amazing human and mentor, someone who has been on our class's entire journey. Please give warm applause to the Danoff Dean of Harvard College, Marvin Bauer Professor of Leadership Development at Harvard Business School, Professor of Sociology, and Faculty Dean of Cavett House, go Cod, Dean Rakesh Karana. So thank you, uh, Kat, for your kind introduction, and thank you to all the great colleagues, friends, and families. I know your heart is just bursting in pride for our students. And good afternoon, seniors. So tomorrow, you're going to be taking part in a 368-year-old tradition. A former Harvard College dean once said, Commencement ceremonies are wonderfully ritualistic, full of incantation, and free of explanation. In other words, they're supposed to be self-explanatory, so there's really no need for me to say anything else today. Thank you and good luck. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know I never waste my final chance to talk about transformative experiences. and our mission of educating citizens and citizen leaders for society. So, this is the moment. The days at Harvard can feel long, but the years are short. And now you're left counting the minutes you have left and reflecting on the almost two million minutes that have passed since you first stepped foot on this campus at Harvard College. Harvard has changed a great deal while you've been here. You're among the first to graduate with our newest concentrations in theater, dance, and media, and environmental science and engineering. Your class started with Harvard time, and then you had to show up on time. <laughs> Sorry, too soon. Um, you witnessed the openings of the Smith Center, the new Cabot Library, and the new art museums. Crema Cafe closed, and Milk Bar opened. All students can now have gender-neutral housing. You've also changed over these four years. You've wrestled with difficult questions. Who am I? Where am I going? What contributions can I make to my community, my country, my society? What do I want for my life and the greater world? Should I work in finance or consulting? Is there a difference? <laughs> or should I get a burrito or a super burrito at Felipe's? These are important questions in life. Through conversations inside and outside the classroom, you've learned what matters to you and listened to what matters to others. You are more aware of who you are and who you are becoming. Through the shared experience of living and working alongside people who come from different backgrounds and different identities than you, you're also more aware of who others are and of what concerns they carry and of the things that they hope for. You've learned to think rigorously and critically about yourselves and about the world you live in. And you've thought critically about the education you were seeking here at Harvard. During your time here, you have witnessed and participated in debates about the value of a liberal arts and sciences education, of studying the humanities, and more recently, the admissions lawsuit and the Varsity Blues scandal have sparked a very public conversation about access to the very education you have received over these past four years. The underlying debate seems to be about who deserves a Harvard education. Those who can pay for it, those who've earned it through their hard work, those who have the right credentials. And what are the right credentials? Those who contribute something unique to our community, who gets to define unique? Today, I'd like to suggest that we reframe the parameters of this discussion, that we interrogate what it means to 
deserve something in the first place. This may seem like an awkward topic to bring up at commencement, a time when we celebrate all that you've achieved, but that's what makes it the right topic at the right time. Four years ago, when I met you at convocation, I said these words, you all belong here. I meant them then, and I mean it now. You have made me so proud. But did you deserve to be here? Tomorrow you'll leave here with a Harvard diploma. Do you deserve it? I know I didn't get one, I didn't get into Harvard. Um, but I'm really asking this question, does the person sitting next to you deserve it? Does anyone? What do we have because we deserve it? And what do we have because of a combination of hard work, luck, and the privileges sociologists call structural inequities? I had this conversation recently with my son about the game of Monopoly, a game that's become synonymous with the capitalist system. According to the capitalist ethos, we're told we win that we deserve to win because of our skill, our hard work, our contributions. And yet, in the game of Monopoly, we often win or lose because we roll the dice and land on Park Place, or go to jail, or because we do not pass go, and thus do not collect our $200. In that way, Monopoly is similar to real life, determined by factors beyond our control. But of course, in real life, we don't all begin with a handout from the bank, the way we do in a game of Monopoly, or even hold the dice. A few years ago, researchers at UC Berkeley conducted a series of studies about Monopoly. In one part of the study, one player got $2,000 from the Monopoly bank at the start of the game and received $200 each time he passed go. The second player was given $1,000 at the start and received $100 for passing go. At first, the person who started with more money felt guilty for being unjustly rewarded. But quickly, the player with the initial advantages started dominating and whooping and hollering when he built a hotel or the other player landed on one of his properties. The study reflected what we see all the time in society. Even when you give certain players big structural advantages, extra money to start, double the money when they pass go, they will still come to believe they deserve their success. I feel very fortunate to be a faculty member at Harvard. When I tell people what I do, the usual response is, congratulations, you must have worked hard. Yes, I like to think I did. But I'm also in this country because my father literally won the immigration lottery when the United States removed the barriers to non-European immigration in the 1960s. I'm here because I was fortunate enough to have a professor at SUNY Binghamton where I started college, who suggested I transfer to Cornell, where I then had an opportunity to do research for a professor who inspired me to become an academic. And guess what? I only got into her class because I won yet another lottery. After college, I landed at a company that only recruited at selective private schools like Cornell and would never have found me at Binghamton. So I ask you, what proportions of my accomplishments can I attribute to my own hard work? Conservatively, I would attribute 85% of where I am due to the circumstances that were outside of my control. Tomorrow, as your family and friends congratulate you on your hard work and your many accomplishments, I hope you will stop and reflect on what brought you here and what sustained you while you were here and ask yourself, how much of this did I deserve? Who are the people who supported my journey here? What circumstances allowed me to succeed within the systems that make it harder for others to succeed? While we've become better here at Harvard at acknowledging the structural barriers that prevent everyone from having access to success, at acknowledging and naming privilege, we often fall prey to the phenomena psychologists call the self-serving bias. The idea that when we do succeed, we credit our own efforts rather than the tailwinds that have carried us. Starting tomorrow, each of you will share the advantages that come with a Harvard diploma. Tomorrow, you will be the alumni that future students will talk about and seek for mentorship, jobs, and access. So today is exactly the right day for all of us to reflect on the dangers of overemphasizing the concept of deserve and also who we decide to help. 
We've seen dangers at the national and international level of putting too much weight on this concept. Who deserves citizenship? Those who are born into it? Those who are fleeing from untold horrors and are being separated from the children whose lives they are trying to save? Who deserves health insurance? Those who can pay for it? Those who will die without it? Who deserves to graduate from an Ivy League college? I want to propose today that we stop talking about what we deserve, what anyone deserves. This notion is outdated and it's corroding our civic fabric. Instead, I propose that we resolve to do better at balancing the recognition of merit with the acknowledgement of the other factors that play such a large role in all our accomplishments, and that we resolve to be honest with ourselves in openly acknowledging the systemic inequities that make this language of deserve so insidious. As an institution, Harvard has made some marked progress in the time that you've been here with recruitment initiatives to reach out to applicants who may not have considered Harvard in the past, to invest in financial aid, to create a diverse community. And yet, as Caroline Hoxby's research on higher education has revealed, there are so many other prospective students out there who did not have the means to apply, the information about financial aid, the person to drive them to school, buy them a computer, or pay for an internet connection. Who would, in our current language, equally deserve to be here? As a university and as a society, we seem to go two steps forward and one step back in our efforts to acknowledge the problems with embracing the myths of the self-made person. Myths that are really hard to let go of, even as they are contradicted by sociology, history, and reality. When the world seems zero-sum and a scarcity mindset prevails, it's understandable to want to frame what we have as something we deserve and what others don't as a result of something they did wrong. But I hope that your four years at Harvard have taught you that our problems will not be solved by this approach. This thinking is counter to both facts and the spirit of freedom, dignity, and equal opportunity that is needed to heal our society and recognize our interdependence. As individuals, we stand to benefit from the idea out there that there's an objective way to measure what we deserve but we also lose. If we pat ourselves on the back for our hard work and our achievements without acknowledging the role of other factors, we may feel that we deserve more than others. Our Harvard diploma is a marker of that in the world. So what's the alternative? If we stop thinking in terms of what we deserve, we will no doubt be better equipped to work on a sustainable and equitable society and acknowledge the increasingly dynastic transmission of political, social, and economic privileges governing our society. But if we go too far, we may end up minimizing our talents of accomplishments in ways that diminish our agency as individuals, as citizens, and as leaders. Perhaps by retiring the word deserve, we can search for a better language to explain our successes and our failures. A couple of years ago, the Crimson wrote an editorial titled don't look at your admissions file, in which they lamented the fact that over 100 students a month were requesting to look at their admissions files. They described this downside as the fetishization of elite college admissions and the focus on admissions rather than on the experience of attending college. Maybe instead of, re seeking, instead of seeking to reaffirm our status or reassuring ourselves of what we deserve or justifying why we have what we have, we should shift our focus to what we deserve to notions like duty and responsibility, to how we can use our talents rather than how we should be rewarded for them. We should be able to find more meaning, more possibility in our accomplishments from the work itself, from the connections with others we forge when we're engaged in our work, from trying to create a world in which there is no scarcity, in which everyone can thrive. In his 1966 speech to the National Union of South African Students in Cape Town, Robert Kennedy, an alum, said, each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. If we have succeeded over these past four years in our mission of educating citizens and citizen leaders for society, you will leave here ready to send forth your own ripples of hope. If we have succeeded 
you will stand up for what matters even if you have nothing to gain personally by doing so. You will act to improve the lives of others, whether through your career, your public service, or your acts of selflessness in your community. You will use what you have learned here to reflect upon and critically appraise our society and your role in it. And you will understand that your future callings and careers are not simply a means to the acquisition of private rewards and advantages, but also in the service of larger ideals. And that your rewards will come as much from the satisfaction that comes from advancing the common good as from any personal enrichment or status or prestige. Your choice to invite Vice President Gore as your class day speaker demonstrates that you share this vision for the future. I'm reminded of something Vice President Gore said after his film, An Inconvenient Truth, won the Oscar. When asked about his reaction to the accolades, he said, and I quote, I've been around long enough to know that a red carpet is just a rug, end quote. Indeed, you've invited him here today as your class day speaker not because of the many awards he has won, but because of the important and inspiring work that he has done and the way he has led us by example to confront the challenges of our planet. When you arrived here four years ago, I asked you to think about what kind of world you wanted to live in and how you could best use your talents to create that world and to keep those questions in mind as you made choices about how you spent your time here at the college. Now, four years later, the world has changed, and so have you. And I want to leave you with the same question. What kind of world do you want to live in? And how are you going to use your talents and gifts? And what have you learned here to create that world? Class of 2019, imagine this world, plan it, and then with hard work and a strong tailwind, make it happen. I wish you a life of peace and goodness. Good afternoon. My name is Morgan Buchanan and I serve as the secretary for the class of 2019. It is my absolute honor to introduce our next speaker, Alice Hill, AB 81, PhD 91, and parent AB 16, AB 20. Alice currently serves as the first vice president of the Harvard Alumni Association and is its incoming president. She started on the Harvard Alumni Association Board of Directors as a director for Australasia after serving as president of the Harvard Club of Victoria. She has also served on the HAA Awards Committee and as vice president of university-wide alumni affairs with a focus on the engagement of graduate and professional school alumni. Alice is also the first incoming HAA president from Canada and from Australia. In between, she has lived and or worked on all of the continents except Antarctica. Her <laughs> Her career began with the Government of Canada and has included the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, McKinsey & Co., London Economics, and Frontier Economics. She is the founder of the Early Years Education Program, which protects the early childhood development of children in the child protection system. Please join me in welcoming Alice. Thanks, Morgan. Sorry, I'm just playing with this. Thanks. Um, that was small print and I'm a little bit older. Um, good afternoon. I'm from Melbourne in the state of Victoria, Australia. And I'm from Inuvik in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And I'm from Kirkland House. <laughs> and I am from Wigglesworth F-22, just over there. <laughs> and why am I telling you this? It's not just because I want to give a shout out to everyone in the class of 2019 that lived in Wigglesworth, although I want to do that too. So hello, Wigglesworth. <laughs> I'm telling you this because by telling you where I'm from, I'm telling you about the places that have made me who I am. 
Place matters because our experience of place shapes us. Living in Australia, I'm especially aware of place and connection to what we call country. The indigenous peoples of Australia are the world's oldest continuous civilization. There have been at least 60,000 years of continuous settlement and there is emerging evidence that people have been in place in Australia for as long as 120,000 years. This history underpins the Australian experience. At every gathering like this, we acknowledge country. Today, in this place, on behalf of all of us, I would like to acknowledge country. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the place in which we meet, the Massachusetts people and their elders, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples with whom Harvard has a long historical relationship. And I would like to acknowledge all other elders who are here today. We are honored and sustained by your presence. In our 1650 charter, Harvard College was dedicated to the education of the English and Indian youth of this country, and we are all the beneficiaries and stewards of that ambition. If you and your families and friends haven't yet had the opportunity to read the plaque on Matthews College at the site of the original Indian College, I urge you to do it before you leave the yard today. Place and connection matter. Your four years at Harvard have shaped you, and no matter where you go from here, Harvard will always belong to you and you to Harvard. Tomorrow, you'll be graduating from the college together with the students from the graduate schools right here in Tercentenary Theatre. You will all be joining the community of more than 370,000 Harvard alumni from around the world who belong to this university and to each other. I am the first Vice President of the Harvard Alumni Association, which was founded in 1840 to bring this community together to support and steward this university. As President Backow says, Harvard is its people. Your classmates and other students and the faculty and staff who work here are what has made your Harvard experience. You've probably spent time this week reflecting on what an experience it has been and if you haven't, other people have been doing it for you. You all know how lucky you are to be here, and nearly four years after you've arrived on campus, you may still be pinching yourselves. Some of you may have had a completely untroubled run from your first day on campus. In a class of 1,554, I suppose there might be one or two of you. However, most of you will have faced gut-wrenching challenges at some point over the past four years. Whether it was the first year roommate who didn't sleep and didn't think you should either, or the graduate seminar you weren't quite ready for, or financial pressures, or not making the cut for the sport or organization you had your heart set on, or missing your family and friends, or all of the above and more. Really, truly, Harvard is challenging and that too has formed you. You should be proud to be here today, and you know your family and friends are proud too. This week, you may be looking around at your classmates, and you may be thinking that you will never find a community like this again. I have some news. Harvard is even bigger and better after you graduate. You are joining a community that includes everyone who has ever studied or worked at Harvard, a community that reaches to all parts of the world. Whether you live or travel, be it in Boston, Dallas, Salt Lake City, or Seattle, or in Ulaanbaatar, Mumbai, Nairobi, London, or Moscow, or in San Diego, Santiago, Melbourne, or Jakarta, or anywhere else, Harvard alumni are there and we are waiting to meet you, and we already have your back. You belong, and you will always belong. Moreover, tomorrow you join the guardians of the university. This is an enormous responsibility, which we hold together, kind of like an infinity stone. 
You have both the right and the responsibility to elect the overseers of the university and the elected directors of the Harvard Alumni Association. Tomorrow afternoon, you'll have your first opportunity to attend, as degree holders, the 149th meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association, presided over by the president of the HAA, Margaret Wang, and with our honored guest, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. That is just the beginning. Wherever, however, and whenever, there are opportunities for you to connect to your Harvard community. It could be through one of the 53 shared interest groups, like the Science Fiction Network, or the Harvard Latino Alumni Alliance, or through your local club, or through admissions interviewing, or via your class reunions, or by continuing to hang out with your roommates. I still do, and this last weekend we celebrated our birthdays together, 38 years after graduating. Look for us on the Harvard Alumni Association website, on our club and shared interest group websites, our Facebook pages, on our Instagram and Twitter feeds, and even in the depths of subreddits. As we say at the Alumni Association, because we're all nerds too, Veritas, ubiquitas, eternitas. Harvard, everywhere, forever. Welcome to the Harvard alumni community. Come and find us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Glissendorf. I am a proud resident of FOHO and one of the Class of 2019 gift marshals. Um, it is my privilege to share with you today the results of this year's senior gift campaign. Over 700 seniors contributed to the campaign, totaling nearly $20,000. This $20,000 supports every single one of our experiences. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Zia, a, re a resident of Lowell House and also a Class of 2019 gift marshal. Senior gift contributions directly support programs such as financial aid, brain break, mental health facilities, and a variety of other exciting new initiatives that require funding for innovation. As we prepare to join generations of alumni before us as we graduate tomorrow, we hope to continue to sustain and improve the Harvard experience. Thank you for your support. Thank you for making an impact. Thank you for improving the Harvard experience for future generations. Thank you for giving to gift and fueling the flame. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Juliana Rodriguez. <laughs> I am a program marshal for the class of 2019, and it is my pleasure to introduce Eunice Mwabe, our Harvard Order. <laughs> Eunice has long had a talent and love for chemistry and math. At Harvard, she ultimately concentrated in anthropology believing that the liberal arts can transform our understanding of communities distinct from our own. She is interested in bridging the gap between engineering projects and the communities they serve, believing too often community members are not involved in important decision-making processes. In the future, Eunice hopes to redesign the ways engineering and design are taught in the African continent and empower more women to enter engineering and design. I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Eunice in an anthropology class sophomore year, and I can testify wholeheartedly that then, as now, Eunice has a deep love for humanity. This love allows her to make insightful and empathetic observations of the communities she works alongside. In college, Eunice has been involved with faith groups, 
Interfaith Dialogue, and the Kumba Singers of Harvard College. She is tremendously devoted to and grateful for her family and friends. Eunice's achievements stem from an intense commitment to service and a passion for bridging divides within communities, cultures, and even nations. Please join me in welcoming a humble scholar, a kind friend, and a global changemaker, Eunice Mabe. Love you too. <laughs> As a little girl growing up in a farm just outside of Nairobi, Kenya, I spent a lot of time wondering about the world outside. I spent my weekends watching TV and listening to music. I watched old 60s movies on school nights when I was supposed to be asleep. And I read a lot of books. I mean, a lot of books. I devoured media because I was thirsty to understand the world outside the confines of my otherwise simple, comfortable, and incredibly joyful upbringing. So it was no surprise that everything I knew about America, I knew from media. And this was before social media, so the variety of images I had of the United States was limited to what movies wanted me, an outsider, to know about this land of the free and home of the brave. I watched movies about American high schools in particular, and I found them absolutely fascinating. And I learned a lot. For example, I learned that in America, you could walk out of classes before teachers dismissed you, just as long as the bell had rang. And I thought to myself, indeed, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> because that kind of behavior wouldn't fly where I'm from. In America, becoming homecoming king and homecoming queen was a big deal, but I never understood where home was or where people had gone enough to be coming. Um, I also learned that in America, everyone was always looking for a prom date and that if you dropped your books and someone picked them up for you and gazed into your eyes, then at the end of the year, they would become your prom date. To date, I find it utterly impressive that the content was that consistent across the board. You watched Mean Girls and it, it was like you had watched everything. <laughs> Yet these thoroughly analyzed case studies of my peers could never have prepared me for the past four years as an international student at Harvard. In fact, in a way, I held a lot of misconceptions about the United States because of them. Now, I know more often than not, this phenomenon happens the other way around. For instance, if I walk into a room and I say, hi, my name is Moabe, and I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, a lot of things might go through your mind, like, wow, she speaks such good English. <laughs> or perhaps you might ask yourself the age-old question and what I'm sure we are all wondering today. I wonder whether she's listened to Ariana Grande's music. Yet in the same way, I too had my own stereotypes about the United States. There were stories I had heard throughout my life that had embedded plenty of assumptions in my mind. Racial stereotypes, stereotypes about people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, stereotypes about American preferences. At times, I wouldn't realize I had these perceptions in my mind, but I always found myself holding on to them ever so tightly whenever I encountered something new or different that I wasn't willing to try. The thing with stereotypes that makes them so powerful is that they menacingly appear to be true, and that it can be so comfortable to hold on to them because predictability is easy to work with. Nuance makes things complicated. Nuance doesn't fit into policy or captivating film narratives. And once you're comfortable enough in what you know, there's no reason to step out of it. I have always been fascinated by people, cultures, history, why we think the way we think based on where we grew up or our experiences. And it was this fascination that led me to the anthropology department. 
I was excited at the prospect of a concentration where, for the most part, I got to observe people and theorize about why they do what they do. At first, this started as a self-centered process. In the midst of my debilitating homesickness and reluctance to adjust, I needed an excuse to get, to get out of having to engage with this new country and its people by delving deeper to understand myself, my roots, and my culture. On any lovely Wednesday afternoon, you'd find me at a section in Toza, either finding a way to connect every possible theory to the African continent, or vehemently retorting to something a peer had said, and it always sounded like, well, I just want to push back on that for a little bit, and say that that is based on a very Western framework of thinking. Around my friends, I started every statement in, with, in my culture, especially when I didn't want to try something new, like, in my culture, we don't eat quinoa. <laughs> or, in my culture, we don't ask professors about their weekends, or agree to call them by their first names. I'm sorry, Dean Kura, I mean, Rakesh. <laughs> And while this transformative liberal arts education has given, me <laughs> has given me the tools to explain where I'm from, or why you wouldn't find me running by the Charles in the winter when no one is chasing me, <laughs> self-centered intellectual pursuit can get incredibly dissatisfying and ultimately lonely. And so I began observing Americans instead. Away from the images that had for so long filled my head, I promptly began my fieldwork outlining the rituals among American 20-year-olds, their sociality, their tribal customs and norms, what they found taboo to talk about in public, their different kinship systems and values for concepts like personal space, and how how's it going isn't actually a question about how it's going. <laughs> Eventually, I too began to participate in the natives' rituals, annual festivals like the Super Bowl, and this collaborative activity that was creating a March Madness bracket. I started watching American news as an empathy exercise, really. <laughs> and slowly but surely, my eyes began to open to certain realities about the American experience through the lens of Harvard class of 2019 that bring it on one, two, and three could never have taught me, not even in a million years. There were experiences that brought us together as a community and reminded me of the universality of our experiences. It was in the looks of awe and amazement and chagrin for some, when we witnessed Adam's house rise like a phoenix from the ashes, blessing us with what had to be the greatest housing video of all time. Go at us. It was in your faces every time you worried about the inequalities of your education system. It was in your pain when another unarmed black man was shot. It was in the face of an understaffed homeless shelter and an increasingly gentrifying town. Now, I know Harvard is not representative of the entire United States. In fact, if anything, this heavily endowed bubble is far from the reality faced by millions in this country. But if there is anything I am thankful for, it has been the opportunity to have been part of class of 2019 a class of strong, talented, beautiful, smart, ambitious young people who have shared with me little snippets of where they're from and where they hope to go. And so at the end of this anthropological study, I'd like to share with you all my findings based on the statistical sample that has been my interactions with the class of 2019. The most important of them being that people are people, and joy is joy, and pain is pain everywhere. And we cannot limit ourselves to what we know based on where we come from. In the same vein, let it not be that this Harvard experience becomes our culture, if you will. 
that we get so attached to bleeding this crimson blood that we are so unwilling to step out and be challenged to learn something new or presently engage when we encounter something or someone different. Statistically speaking, those who have left these grounds have had a palpable impact in the world. Those who have gone ahead of us have disrupted culture, transformed global politics, revolutionized economies, and we will most probably go ahead and do equally significant things, if not more. But these accolades, these achievements, do not make us any better, our lives any more valuable, our joy any more valid, our anger any more justified than the man across the street for whom every dollar counts. And this is in no way meant to devalue our worth. If anything, it takes away this pressure that we need to prove a point to the world, that we need to prove that we went to Harvard and did enough with this opportunity. Class of 2019, you graduate from Harvard but you're worth so much more in and of yourself. And so I implore you, in the words of the great philosopher of our day, Pulitzer Prize winner, Kendrick Lamar, sit down, be humble. Humility not being defined by how much we downplay the power that comes with the name. Humility not being saying to those who ask that we went to a school in Boston, but humility being the willingness to see all humanity as equal, Harvard degree notwithstanding. Humility being the willingness to learn as much as we can about those different from us, outside what we know, and then using this Harvard degree to, as we say in Kumba, do what we can with what we have to leave a space better than we found it. The world is in need of more people who walk through life with this sense of wonder. People courageous enough to engage with that which is different or strange or even unacceptable, willing enough to step out of what they think they know and humble enough to learn from each experience. More than ever, our generation needs leadership that is willing to love and serve within this rare blend of courage and humility. Courageous enough to secure the bag, humble enough to do it without letting it define you. It is my hope, class of 2019, that it shall be said of us that we embodied this in the years to come. Thank you and congratulations. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Popovsky. I have had the honor and privilege of serving as one of our program marshals for the class of 2019. Today is a day of celebration. We celebrate an amazing journey and all the transformative experiences that have put us in our seats today. We also celebrate and indeed we thank the people that are sitting next to us, our friends, our family, our mentors that have come out all this way. Let us also celebrate and let us remember everyone that we have lost during this journey. I reckon most of us have lost someone that we hold dear or we know someone that has. I would like to take a moment now to remember and honor these individuals. One person particularly close to heart for myself and for many of us is one of our class's own and indeed one of our class's best, uh, who passed away the summer before this academic year, Courtney Blair. Courtney Blair will always hold a special place in my heart and indeed for in the hearts of, of, of many of us here today. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Laura Delaney, Tynan Jackson, 
and Nicole Nishizawa, who will be speaking in remembrance of Courtney. Courtney Blair was my first friend at Harvard. We met at Visitas when we happened to pass each other on the street, and she stopped and introduced herself. Unbeknown to me, she had already decided that we were to become great friends. Our subsequent hangouts and fast friendship were the result of what I came to admire most about Courtney, her resolve. Most people can't bring themselves to stop a stranger on the street and strike up a conversation. But Courtney Blair had a habit of not doing things like most people did them. She was independent and confidently walked her own path. She had an unwavering ability to stand on her own and do things the Courtney Blair way. When she set her mind to something, she saw it through. She was determined to reach her dreams. She wanted to leave a mark on the world somehow, to honor the legacies of those that came before her, and to be an inspiration for those that would come after. Like many of us, she didn't know exactly what she wanted to do, but she worked hard for the freedom to carve her own path. Courtney excelled academically and helped others with their work by peer tutoring or simply spreading her determination. There were many late nights when she calmed me with reassurance that even if we found ourselves starting the paper at three o'clock in the morning, we would get it done by nine when it was due. For Courtney, there was always a way. She stayed true to what worked for her and never doubted herself or her ability to catalyze change. As we move forward, face challenges, and witness injustice, take inspiration from Courtney Blair. We were lucky to have had her as a part of this class. Thank you. If you asked any graduate today to name the best part of their Harvard experience, most would say the people. I would. In addition to my incredible professors, I attribute most of my growth in college to my one-of-a-kind friends. My freshman roommate, Courtney Blair, was one of those best friends. She was a fierce intellectual. She graduated salutorian of her high school and began her career in her sophomore year at a premier consulting firm. She was also an incredible athlete, lettering in four sports in high school before taking on boxing here at the college. But beyond all of her accolades, what made Courtney exceptional was the inspiring love and loyalty she had to her friends. Before Courtney, I had never known it was possible to see someone and see so much worth in me, to love me so full me, fully. I've never been so comfortable, so at ease, so open to anyone else. She's the only one who would tell me what I needed to hear. She made me better. Though sometimes I like to think I'm special for this, the truth is that Courtney had this effect on a lot of people. Her easygoing, humorous, down-to-earth nature was what made her so attractive. You wanted to be her friend, to laugh at her ridiculous stories, to be entertained by her impersonations, and to learn from her wealth of knowledge. She was who you wanted to celebrate with, and the person who would have the biggest smile here today. Today I ask you to continue to honor Courtney through the appreciation of and commitment to the friendships you've formed here at Harvard. Fully enjoy the time spent with the people you love. Bask in their warmth and share more of your own light. For those that you really love, no amount of time will be enough. Thank you. Phenomenal woman. That's who she was. As cool as she pleased, like a warm summer breeze. The flash of her teeth, the joy in her feet. She was a woman phenomenally. I don't think a greater representation of British Jamaican ancestry, brilliance, feminism, and a woman from Atlanta that loved Kid Cudi ever lived. Courtney sought to increase the capacity of every space, 
the quality of every space and the joy of every space she inhabited. Her love was infinite and her friendship was the greatest I have ever experienced. She showed us how to exist and prog progress with heart, laughter, and love. Courtney Blair was a woman like no other, and I had the honor of sharing two transformative years with her. Every day on this campus is a painful yet joyous reminder of our cherished memories and the legacy she left in my heart and the hearts of those in this class. Thank you so much, Courtney, for giving your all to this world. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Simi Shaw. And I'm Tyler Lacomer, and we are program marshals for the class of 2019. Today, it is our distinct honor to introduce the recipients of the Richard Glover and Henry Russell Memorial Award. The class of 2019 comprises countless individuals who have dedicated themselves to serving and changing the lives of others, both at Harvard and beyond. But the great paradox of service is that these individuals and their inspiring efforts often go unacknowledged by our broader communities. As such, the purpose and spirit of the Ames Award is to finally shine a light on these leaders, to honor two unsung heroes in the class of 2019. On June 19th, 1935, Richard, Glo Richard Glover Ames and Henry Russell Ames, brothers and Harvard students, gave their lives to save their father, who was washed overboard during a storm off the coast of Newfoundland. Every year since, the Ames Award has been given in their memory to recognize two members of our class who have shown energy in helping others and who exhibit the same heroic character um, and inspiring inspiration as the Ames brothers. The selection committee received a large number of nominations from faculty, faculty deans, tutors, coaches, and fellow students. At this time, we invite all the nominees for this year's Ames Award to please stand or raise your hand to be recognized for your commitment to service and leadership. I now have the incredible privilege and honor of introducing the first recipient of this year's Ames Award. Valiant, relentless, remarkable. These are but a selection of the words used to describe this Ames honoree. In the words of one of her nominators, in every space on campus that was fortunate enough to have her, she has made a tremendous impact. Her unprecedented, tremendous service spans her roles as a peer advising fellow, as director of PBHA's Chinatown Citizenship, as leader of the Task Force for Asian Pacific American Studies, as a vocal advocate for affirmative action on Harvard's campus and inside the courtroom. She has been at the vanguard of ethnic studies advocacy, impacting tangible change by devoting her time to supporting students and engaging with administrators. She has united entire campus communities through rallies, organized teach-ins, impacting tangible change, and fearlessly sharing her story by starting national conversations. Her, her fierce passion for equality and representation in higher education has manifested both in her student leadership and her academic scholarship. She challenges the status quo, she advocates, she galvanizes. Her mentors and peers collectively attest to a maturity and tenacity beyond her years, such as her compassion, altruism, and spirit, that she has inspired not only concrete change, but also a new generation of student leaders. I could spend the rest of class day detailing her accomplishments, but it is clear that it is the love, care, heart, and soul that she has poured into countless individuals whole communities and causes that merit this award and so much more. Please join me in congratulating our first Ames Award recipient, Sally Chadden.
I am so incredibly honored and excited to introduce the second recipient of this year's Ames Award. Through her four years of dedicated service and allyship to the deaf community, this recipient truly embodies the spirit of the Ames Award. This student went above and beyond just learning American Sign Language and act actively strove to make Harvard a more welcoming place for deaf people. Since 2016, this student has served as an events coordinator for the, on the executive board for PBHA's uh, Deaf Awareness Club with a variety of events aimed toward addressing prejudice and discrimination against the deaf community, educating others on the diversity of deaf experiences and practicing sign language skills, among others. Additionally, she has put an exceptional amount of time toward improving the accessibility of events on campus, leading to, be leading to the beginning of a strong relationship between the Deaf Awareness Club and the Accessible Education Office. Thanks to her, more and more Harvard groups are hiring American Sign Language interpreters for their events. Her selfless devotion to this cause is just one reflection of the student's profound positive impact on campus. After years of knowing her personally, I can sincerely say that this student is a walking ball of sunshine with an incredibly contagious smile and an amazing sense of humor. She's a star in everything she does, whether that is passionately advocating for the deaf community, dancing on the Eleganza stage, or even teaching Zumba classes in the MAC. She inspires us all to be the best version of ourselves, and it would be a crime to not recognize her for it. So please, con please join me in congratulating our second Ames Award recipient, Jessica Akia. My name is Richie He, and I'm honored to introduce our Ivy Order, Nick Hornado. Nick, <laughs> woo, yeah. Nick is a government concentrator and theater secondary from Courier House who has taken part in over 10 theatrical shows at Harvard. He worked for The Late Show with Stephen Colbert last summer and is pursuing comedy in New York after graduation. We became close friends after taking a comedic improv class together in which we got to come up with several bits. One bit we kept doing even after the class ended was this thing where we see each other in public and laugh maniacally and extremely loudly, often past the point of it being funny anymore. Nick is so not afraid to be silly in public that he makes it easier for me to be myself without fear, no matter how absurdly ugly and socially unacceptable this laugh may be. You ready, Nick? Mwahaha. <laughs> Mwahaha. 
Please welcome me in joining and welcoming Nick. Thank you, Richie. <laughs> Dean Karana, Vice President Gore, and the class of 2019. If you are hearing this speech, then I regret to inform you that my at college account will soon be terminated. I don't know most of you, but I thought it'd be most efficient to spam all 3,000 of you anyway. Feel free to reach me at my new email address, nickneedsajob at gmail.com. <laughs> now that that's out of the way, good afternoon, class of 2019. <laughs> my name is Nick Hornado, and I must confess, I don't think I belong here. Now, I don't just mean up here on the stage with the microphone, though I will say the power is so intoxicating I might pass out. <laughs> no, I mean here, graduating with all of you. Four years ago, I arrived with the hopes of becoming as intelligent and influential as people like Al Gore, Sonia Sotomayor, and Jared Kushner. <laughs> but standing here today, I just feel underachieving and way over my head. Also like Jared Kushner. <laughs> Freshman year, Rakesh tried to assure us that we do belong here, that we were just as good as anybody else. <laughs> Funny, my mom said the same thing. In many ways, Rakesh is a lot like my mother. <laughs> He's warm and wants me to do my best. He surprises me with cookies. He's a powerful Mexican woman from the border. Wait, no. Um, <laughs> scratch that. Talk about transformative. <laughs> Yet despite the soothing words you get from your parents or your college dean, there's so much here that can make you feel like you don't belong. Comps. Socioeconomic barriers. Two-step verification. <laughs> Sometimes I want to be remembered for more than 30 days. So over these four years, we looked for ways to prove that we were worthy of Harvard. Some of you found that in the humanities, where you studied 19th century American history. Some of you decided to study casebooks so you could go to Goldman and make obscene amounts of money. And if you're Drew Faust, you were like, ¿Por qué no los dos? Most of you found belonging on Housing Day, when you celebrated your new homes and ridiculed those who got quadded. And that was, eh, that was pretty hurtful, <laughs> particularly as a POC, person of courier. <laughs> and so to my fellow quadlings, I say, do not let these microaggressions get you down. And to the other 75% of you, I say, check your privilege. <laughs> We tried so hard to prove we belonged here, we often divided ourselves. And that sucks, because nobody wants to be told where they do and don't belong. Like when Adam says you don't belong in their D-Hall because it's community night. <laughs> or when HOHS says you do belong in quarantine because you have the mumps. <laughs> that reminds me, um, some of you may have read The Crimson this morning. Wait, sorry, that's a lie. No, none of you did. Um, <laughs> But if you did, you would have noticed that the restaurant John Harvard's closed, uh, or is closing. Indeed, many independently run businesses questioned whether they belonged here, to which landlords responded with a resounding no. <laughs> In fact, I'd like to take a moment to pay tribute to all the local businesses who just couldn't be here with us today. Café Algiers, gentrified August 2017. Oh, this one hurts. Petsy Pies, gentrified January 2019. 
market in the square. Seized! November 2017. Cafe Pamplona. Wait, actually, Cafe Pamplona is still open. I'm just getting ahead of myself. <laughs> of course, not everything here was about exclusion. This year, the Hasty Pudding Theatricals decided to integrate, making the bold statement that women too can be unfunny. <laughs> Our class found unity at the Harvard-Yale game, where we cheered our team on to victory 50% of the time. But, hey, you know, that's life. You take the good with the bad. I mean, for every red spice chicken, there was a red's best fish. For every Harvard meme for elitist 1% tween, there was an obscene meme for rescinded pre-frosh tweens. For every record-setting endowment, there's an investment in funds that support the prison industrial complex as well as the fossil fuel industry, making President Bacow, the Harvard Management Company, and everybody here complicit in the mass incarceration of people of color and the greatest threat to humanity our planet has ever seen! <laughs> this guy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Which reminds me, for every popular vote, there's an electoral vote. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, but the search for Veritas isn't always convenient. <laughs> for many of you, the need to belong hits hardest when you return home. I'm reminded of a song from Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights, in which Nina, I've got some cast members here, in which Nina, a first-gen Latinx student, returns home from freshman year at Stanford and she sings about the pressure of being worthy. She sings, straighten the spine, smile for the neighbors, everything's fine, everything's cool. The standard reply, lots of tests, lots of papers, smile, wave goodbye, and pray to the sky, oh God. What will my parents say? My sophomore year, I acted in Theatro's production of In the Heights, and those lyrics really resonated with me. I too wanted my family to be proud, proud of me and proud of the love and sacrifice they gave and made so that I could end up at a place like Harvard. Um, at the same time, there were rumblings that there wasn't enough Latinx talent to pull off this kind of show, which was funny, but not ha-ha funny, more lampoon funny. For our cast, much of the goal of each performance was to prove ourselves to the doubters. We had four performances and they each had a different energy. The first performance had the excitement and adrenaline of something new. The second performance, we relaxed and even made a couple mistakes. The third performance, the show really grew into something beautiful that we could not have anticipated. And so, by the time we got to the Fork show, we worried. Had we peaked? And what would the audience think? Our director looked at us and said, this show isn't for them. It's for each other. You'll drive yourself crazy if you try and end it on a bang. So just take this last day as a chance to celebrate each other in the times we've had. I'm pretty sure I don't belong here. And if you still have any doubts, maybe you don't belong here either. But Let's just set that aside. You don't have to feel unworthy just because you failed a midterm, or because you got cut from Satire 5 three times, <laughs> or because your last chance dance ended with only a kiss. It was only a kiss! <laughs> Maybe we'll never truly belong at a place like Harvard. Maybe we don't belong among the world's best and brightest, the Jared Kushners of the world. But class of 2019, I can say without a doubt that right now, we all belong with each other. It doesn't matter who you knew or what clubs you joined, because when things went well, we all celebrated at Felipe's. When things went poor, we all mourned 
at Hefe's. <laughs> and we never ate at Zombrero. <laughs> Class of 2019, we got one day left. Don't make it your best. Just make it count. Thank you. And thank you, Mom, Dad, and George, for everything. Good afternoon. My name is Kleana Crabel, and I am a program marshal, and I have the immense privilege of introducing the 51st annual Class Day speaker. He is rightfully acclaimed for the decades of work he has done regarding the climate crisis and environmental justice. He served as the 45th Vice President of the United States for two terms under President Bill Clinton, was the winner of the popular vote in the controversial 2000 presidential election, was the runner-up in Time's 2007 Person of the Year, is the subject of the Oscar-winning documentary An Inconvenient Truth, and is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. A persistent forward thinker, Al Gore is and has been a champion of environmental issues and morally based movements for over four decades. The founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project and co-founder and chairman of Generation Investment Management, he consistently challenges the status quo on the climate crisis, the most urgent issue affecting the world for our generation and future generations. He is an activist, author, public speaker, veteran, vegan, father, an incredible example of what it means to be a truly proactive global citizen. It is with great pleasure I now ask you to help me welcome our 2019 Class Day speaker and fellow former Mauer B resident, Al Gore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Cleanna. I really uh, appreciate that introduction. And uh, let me say to the class of 2019, I really cannot emphasize enough how grateful I am for the honor of your invitation to be here as the speaker on your class day. Thank you very much. It means a great deal to me. <laughs> Dean Rukesh uh, Karana. Uh, Catherine Zhang and all of the members of the uh, committee to the Alumni Association. And let me also give a shout out to my fellow members of the class of 1969, so many of whom are here uh, for our 50th anniversary. Uh, we've had a lot of fun. And of course, I can't help but uh, think back to the time 50 years ago when we sat in these uh, very same seats when our country was going through a tumultuous time politically and socially and there was public anger and outrage fueling activism and protests. Harvard was uh, steeped in the Vietnam War protests. Uh, the administration building was occupied. You've probably heard a great deal about uh, some of those uh, events with all of the remembrances on the anniversary, but we had a president who flouted the law, was hostile to norms, exploited division and hate. Our society and political dialogue were mired in tribalism and polarization, uh, and it's felt sometimes like the challenges would be really difficult to overcome, but we did overcome them and it's useful to think back about that time because of the time we're in right now and I'm going to say a little bit about that in this talk, but I do want to begin by saying to your parents, to your families, to the faculty and staff 
but most of all to all of the members of this class, congratulations. This is a wonderful, wonderful occasion, and tomorrow will be um, a as well. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I was uh, paying attention uh, when Nicholas said there's always a, a popular vote in the Electoral College, and I, <laughs> I actually... Uh, I actually think of the difference between class day and commencement in those terms. <laughs> uh, there was a popular vote to select your speaker here today. Uh, thank you very much. But I can't give you your diplomas. You've got to come back for the true authority on commencement uh, tomorrow, but congratulations uh, to all of you. The last time I spoke during commencement meet week at Harvard was 25 years ago. I was vice president and someone asked me, what is the best thing about being vice president? I said, well, there's the great seal of the vice president of the United States. And if you close one eye and turn your head just right, it says, President of the United States. And, I want to say a few serious words uh, today because you've given me an opportunity and an occasion to do so. And again, my deep, deep gratitude. Veritas, truth is not only Harvard's motto emblazoned on so many of these uh, banners here today, but it is also democracy's shield. And the right to pursue truth is the most fundamental right of them all. That right is now at risk. And as a result, freedom itself is at risk, more so now than it was 50 years ago. Earlier this week, one of my distinguished uh, classmates, Robert Post, professor and longtime former dean at Yale Law School, warned us that in America today we are witnessing what he called, and I quote, an attack on the authority of knowledge. Of course, what we think of as knowledge is always based on our best efforts in the past to establish what is more likely than not to be true, but it's inevitably combined with a legacy of accumulated error sanctified by repetition. And we have learned that our constant asymptotic progress toward veritas requires that reason be used to subject the authority of knowledge to continuous challenge. It is our shared respect or the authority of what we accept mutually as knowledge that undergirds the principle that we are a nation of laws, not men or women. My faith tradition teaches you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, and other traditions teach the same truth in other words. Faith in the power of reason the belief that free citizens can govern themselves wisely and fairly by resorting to logical debate on the basis of the best evidence available instead of on the basis of the exercise of raw power was and remains the central premise of American democracy. And it is precisely that premise that is under assault in our country today. The principal alternative to democracy throughout history has been the consolidation of virtually all state power in the hands of a single strong man who enlists a small group of henchmen to exercise power without the, con the informed consent of the governed. It was in revolt against just such a regime, after all, that America was founded. And when Abraham Lincoln declared at the time of America's greatest challenge that the ultimate question being decided in the Civil War was, quote, whether that nation or any nation 
so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. He was not only saving our union, but he was also recognizing the fact that democracies are rare in history, and they often do not last. And when they fail, as they did in Athens and the Roman Republic, upon both of whose designs our founders drew heavily, what emerges in their place is another strong man, a dictator, as the Romans called him, with an aspiration to dominance which necessitates a constant focus on power. What makes totalitarians and would-be totalitarians so profoundly dangerous is that their hunger for power leads them always to try to establish themselves as the final authority as to what is and is not accepted as knowledge. They want to displace reason as the means to test ideas for their validity. That is why throughout history they have so frequently labeled the free press as the enemy of the people. That is the meaning of the phrase alternative facts. We often say no man is above the law, although the U.S. Justice Department's current policy carves out an exception to that principle for one and only one person. We should also affirm that no person is the sole arbiter of the truth, and to that there must be no exception. However, totalitarians seek to make themselves both above the law and the sole arbiter of truth. That is why we hear threats today to prosecute as criminals those in our law enforcement agencies who have sought to protect our democracy. Supporters of authoritarianism define loyalty to America's core principles as treason against its new would-be sovereign. This explains the appeal to would-be autocrats of multiple bromances with extreme authoritarians, at least one of whom in our current time has been allowed to sink his teeth into America's democratic electoral process and play with it like a chew toy. Zealous would-be autocrats are also dangerous for our country because of their willingness to do serious damage to the structure and norms of our American democracy in order to satisfy their lust for domination of all three branches of government in order to enact their dogma as policy. Supporters of authoritarianism in America have long sought an all-powerful executive using a weakened and obsequious legislative branch to fashion a compliant judiciary in its own image. They endeavor to break down the separation of powers and in place of the current system, they seek to establish a system in which power is unified in the service of a narrow ideology serving a narrow set of interests. It is truly power that is key to understanding the cynical manipulation of facts and the assault on reason. Aristotle once wrote that virtue is one thing. Similarly, respect for the rule of law is one thing. It is indivisible. And as long as it remains indivisible, so will our country. But if those making decisions in our democracy are ever so beguiled by a lust for power that they abandon this unifying principle, then the fabric of our democracy will tear. When the decision-making process is no longer dominated by reason, it quickly becomes far more vulnerable to outcomes determined by the use of raw power, and the temptation to corruption grows accordingly. When reason and logic are removed from the process of democracy, when there is no longer any seeming purpose in debating or discussing the choices we have to make, then all the questions before us are reduced to a simple question. Who can exercise the most power in its rawest form? The system of checks and balances that has protected the integrity of our American system for more than two centuries 
has already been dangerously eroded. If dogma and cultish devotion to a strong man rush in to fill the vacuum left by reason's departure, they allow for the exercise of new forms of power, more arbitrary and less derived from the consent of the governed. In simple terms, when fear and anxiety play a larger role in our society, logic and reason play a diminished role in collective decision making. And unfortunately, the new expressions of power that surface in such circumstances often spring from the deep poisoned wells of racism, ultranationalism, religious strife, tribalism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, sexism and misogyny, homophobia and transphobia, discrimination and abuse of the disabled. Would-be autocrats ignore the warnings of their own experts, forbid dissent, and refuse to test assumptions against the best available evidence. They demonstrate contempt for the basic tenets of rational decision-making, defined as one in which an honest emphasis is placed on obtaining the best evidence and then letting good facts drive good decisions. Instead, the hallmarks of those who are drawn to authoritarianism is a systematic effort to manipulate facts in service to the strong man who advocates a totalizing ideology that's felt to be more important than the mandates of basic honesty. It may be that the legacy of the 20th century's ideologically driven bloodbaths has also included a new cynicism about reason itself. Because reason was so easily used by propagandists to disguise their impulse to power by cloaking it in clever and seductive intellectual formulations. In an age of propaganda, education itself can become suspect, and that can lead would-be authoritarians to profess their love for those they call the poorly educated. When ideology is woven into alleged facts and delivered in fully formed and self-contained packages, people naturally begin to develop some cynicism about what they are being told. When people are subjected to ubiquitous and unrelenting mass advertising, reason and logic often begin to seem like they are no more than handmaidens in the constant selling process. And when these same techniques dominate the political communication sent by candidates to voters, the integrity of our democracy is placed under the same cloud of suspicion. And now social media, with its filter bubbles driven by surveillance capitalism, enhances cynicism and magnifies divisions. Moreover, when middle-income families have seen virtually no increase in take-home pay for more than 40 years, while the wealthiest have become wealthier still, and inequality has risen to levels profoundly dangerous to egalitarianism in American democracy, it is no wonder that self-professed experts are regarded with more cynicism than ever. So this is also the meaning of the present assault on science. Science, which is now being cynically slandered as a conspiracy based on a hoax, the subordination of the best scientific evidence to the cynical greed of those buttressing the power of a would-be autocrat is yet another strategy for controlling policy by distorting and suppressing the best available information. So the ideology of authoritarianism is now not only a threat to democracy in America, now, because of the attacks on climate science, it has become a threat to the survival of human civilization as we know it and even potentially to the capacity of the human species to endure. 
I learned about climate science as a student here in this university from a great scientist and teacher named Roger Revell, who designed the first experiments to measure the accumulation of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. I went, by the way, to the 100th birth, the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of his birth and learned in my research that he, as a young man, the same age I was when I first heard him, had been so inspired his life was transformed. It caused me to wonder how many chains of inspiration stretch back in time. And as you in the class of 2019 think about the professors who have inspired you, carry with you an obligation to conduct yourselves as citizen leaders of our society in ways that will inspire others. We have to restore the role of reason and logic and rational debate. Thomas Jefferson would have recognized the linkage between the absence of reason and the emergence of absurd and dangerous tragedy. As he wrote to James Smith in 1822, and I quote, man once surrendering his reason has no remaining guard against absurdities the most monstrous and like a ship without rudder is the sport of every wind. Speaking of wind, the winds are increasingly destructive in our world. Yesterday was the 13th day in a row when multiple tornadoes touched down in the United States. 500 this month. Hurricanes have become much stronger. Today, the Arkansas River is four feet higher than the all-time record flood stage. The Mississippi tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into the sky every day as if it is an open sewer. And the accumulated quantity now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 500 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. This extra heat energy is disrupting the water cycle, causing massive historic downpours, rain bombs, massive floods interspersed with deeper and longer droughts, threatening crop failures and food shortages, shortages of fresh potable water, melting the ice masses on the land of Greenland, Antarctica, and raising sea level dramatically, causing new health risks, climate refugees, destabilizing liberal political systems, the sixth great extinction threatening the loss of 50% of all of the living species with which we share this planet in this century, on our watch. So I'm here in response to your invitation, grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, but I am also here to recruit you. We have work to do, all of us. We must see the seriousness and historic nature of this challenge. And I tell you that there is an abundance not only of danger but an abundance of hope. We are seeing surprising, even startling and historic advances in the technologies of renewable energy. The cost of electricity from solar and wind has been plummeting so fast that it is now cheaper in most geographies around this world than electricity from burning fossil fuels. Electric vehicles are increasing in number and popularity. Batteries are becoming much more affordable. Regenerative agriculture uh, is replacing the industrial and factory models of the past. Not quickly enough, but it is happening. Sustainable forestry and circular manufacturing must be adopted. The fastest growing job in the United States of America is solar installer. For the last five years, it has grown six times faster than all other jobs. The second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Fossil fuels can no longer compete. The largest sovereign wealth fund in the world in Norway, financed completely by oil and gas revenues, has started divesting from fossil fuels, and so should Harvard University.
That is one of the remaining challenges for this university. I want to make it clear, this is a moral issue. It was immoral to continue investing in apartheid. In the 1980s, when I was in the United States Senate, the student activists of that day at Harvard recruited me to run as one of their candidates, as a candidate for the Board of Overseers, in order to help push the university past its resistance to divest of apartheid stocks and stop supporting that racist system in South Africa. Now, fortunately, the student activists recruited someone else to run with me on that ticket, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, so I did not have to do much heavy lifting. But the university did respond, as they responded when they realized it was immoral to invest in tobacco stocks. Well, let me tell you, the, the, the oil companies and the gas and coal companies today have been following the same strategy innovated by the tobacco companies years ago when they decided to undermine the authority of knowledge. They wrote in a famous phrase, and I quote from the tobacco industry documents, doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. The fossil fuel companies adopted the same playbook the same strategy, hired many of the same PR strategists uh, and, and uh, technicians. Last week, another new study found that our country has a much higher percentage of people who deny the climate crisis is real than any other nation, and it's no wonder why. Because they have been, the American people have been the targets of a massive, well-organized and lavishly funded campaign of disinformation designed to spread doubt and confusion and prevent the formation of a political consensus necessary to adopt new policies to save the future of human civilization. Why would Harvard University continue to support with its finances an industry like this that is in the process of threatening the future of humanity? Ladies and gentlemen, we have to change. We cannot continue on our present course. And in order to solve the climate crisis, we must solve the democracy crisis. So I said earlier I'm here to recruit you. But I want to close by underscoring the existence of an abundance of hope. We have to change, but we can change. We have the ability to change. And the obstacles to change can be overcome, but it will require a decision on the part of you in this graduating class and all of those who are part of your networks of family and friends to decide that it is important enough to do. But do not give up hope. Just as apartheid was ended, just as the civil rights movement profoundly changed this country, even though much more change is needed. Just as women's suffrage was finally achieved, even though much more must be done. Just as gay and lesbian rights have now finally reached the point that gay marriage is legal and accepted and celebrated and supported in all 50 states of the United States. Many thought that would never occur. It would not be possible. But all of these reforms were achieved when the underbrush was cleared away to reveal the central choice between what is right and what is wrong. And when that central choice is thus revealed, the outcome is foreordained because of who we are as human beings. I refuse to believe 
that we as human beings do not have a sufficient capacity to make changes of the magnitude that are now necessary to save our future. And if you doubt for one moment that we do have the ability to change or the will to change, please always remember that the will to change is itself a renewable resource. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, Vice President Gore, for your inspiring remarks and for your call to make better this university that we've come to love. Good afternoon. My name is Anant Pai. And I'm a member of Adams House. <laughs> it is an honor to serve as your second marshal. As I look across the yard, I think of all of the steps that we've taken in our time here. It is 172 steps from Matthews Hall to the Science Center, or 89 paces of a sprint if you overslept. <laughs> As freshmen, we learned to navigate Harvard, a place that for all its fame still felt enigmatic. Adams House to Seaver Hall is 266 steps. As we became upperclassmen, our footprints began to bore into the ground for the first time leaving their mark on this sometimes impenetrable institution. Tomorrow, we will take the 197 steps from Tercentenary Theatre to Johnston Gates, our final moment as Harvard students, but it is the steps that we take after that will matter most. It is exciting to imagine all of the paths that will be forged. Friends, family, faculty, I thank you again for joining us in celebrating this moment. To conclude this program, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our class day Otists, whose work reflects the spirit of our class. I am thrilled to welcome Albert Shalom, Aidan Connaughton, Gabriel Kuntz, Calais Galbraith, Amy Garcia, Brandon Kim, Chang Saab Lim, Samuel Reed, Joanna Tao, Hadley Wife, and Nathan Wolf to perform the ode. <laughs> Following the conclusion of the ode, seniors, please move to the steps of Widener Library for our class photo. Now please rise and join us in this performance sung to the tune of Fair Harvard. Lyrics can be found in the program.